Did I look wonky this week? I looked at the video last week, and it was like all, y'all had me out here looking like a fool on the internet. You didn't tell me my, my thing was all off like centered this week. I hope it looks stabilized a little bit this morning. Good morning. Thanks for being here this morning. We are so excited that you are here. We are all the way up to part seven of a series we are calling Who He Is. And I know you said part seven. Man, how did, if I missed the first six parts, how am I going to be able to know the backstory on this? So don't be intimidated by that. Honestly, truly, the reason we're saying part, 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 part seven is so that, like, I was at a pastor's conference this week. They were like, how old's your church? I was like, well, we just finished part six. So we're six weeks old. Like, it was easy for me to orient myself into what we are doing right now. What we're learning about in this series is who Jesus Christ is, what his character is about, what kind of man he was as he lived his life here on this earth. Because as we get going, we are five weeks away, exactly almost one month from Easter. Yo, Easter at Freedom Church. It's going to be lit. It's going to be what's up. We're going to have a family service. There are going to be kids in here. There are going to be kids' activities. There's going to be a photo booth. Uh, there are going to be an Easter egg hunt afterwards. It's going to be a lot of fun. So be inviting your friends out for Easter. You're going to get a lot about that. But as we get into Easter, Easter is all about what he did, right? That single most important moment in the history of mankind, what he did on the cross. And sometimes we lose focus of we only talk about what he did, which is enough. It's enough. Putting your faith in what he did on that cross will get you to heaven. But some, we want to, and the Gospel of John is unique in the way of being able to get to know Jesus Christ on a personal level, what his character was about. Because as we get to know the character of Jesus Christ, we can get to become more like Jesus Christ. So that's really the goal of this. And as we go, part one, part two, part three, if you're interested in catching up, we're on podcasts. Look at that. Apple Podcasts, Spotify, your, your podcast thing. You can go on there and you can see all of the previous uh, six weeks of, of lessons because each of them are individual on, in who Jesus is, a different aspect of his characteristics. So today we are all the way up to part seven that I've titled For the Trailer. One of my favorite things that Hollywood does is in movies, Whenever they say the name of the movie inside the movie. I'm always that guy that's like pointing at the screen. Ah, I saw what you did there. Whether it's like a very young Joseph Gordon-Levitt, very eagerly looking in and saying, no, really, there are angels in the outfield. Yep, yep, I saw what, they, I saw what you did right there. Or Ashton Kutcher comes outside and he goes, dude, where's my car? Like, it's, that's just, they just right there, right? Or uh, my favorite one, I was looking some of these up, my favorite one is when a beleaguered Sly Stallone stops and says, stop, or my mom will shoot. They, they really horseshoed that one in. I mean, come on. They really horseshoed that one in. Um, sometimes they fit a little bit easier than others. Hey, Spider-Man, you're really far from home. I love when they, when they do that. That's my kind of movie. I don't have the most mature palette when it comes to movies. You get a good car race scene. You say the title of the movie inside the movie. You got me, especially when they drive a little too fast or too furious. Yep, that, that, always, that always gets me. All right, well, we're going to do that. Why do they do that? Why do they say the name of the movie inside the movie? Well, it's for the trailer. They do that just for the trailer, right? So when they release the trailer and they get ready to promote the movie, they can go back to that one singular line and they can orient the audience to exactly what this movie is about. They want everybody to know when they show out that trailer, they have that line cued away that they can cut it and they can go to it. There might be articles written about a movie, interviews given about the movie, all kinds of opportunities to get to know for the creators to, to tell you what the movie's about. But this specifically is there so that the creator of the movie can tell you what is going to be central and is the title and the whole thing about the movie. As we are studying through the Gospel of John and as we've come to this point and we are, are getting to know who Jesus is and there are these statements that Jesus is giving, I am the light in the darkness, I am the way, I am the door, I am the good shepherd, I am all of these things. At this point, we get to the point where he's able to drop the line today that is for the trailer when he says in John chapter 11, verse 25, I am the resurrection and the life. I am the resurrection and the life. If you have your Bibles, you can open them up to John chapter 11 this morning is where home base 
is going to be. He is all things. In this series, by now, these six parts that we've gone through so, thus far, um, to this point, you should know that Jesus is all things. That's the point that we're trying to make. When God spoke to Moses in the Old Testament and he asked who he was, because God was giving Moses some very important things that he was going to do, stuff that was going to freak everybody out. And so Moses said to God, God, I need to know who you are, because they're going to say, how, what authority are you coming to me saying, hey, we need to break out of bondage and go across the sea and, and get into this promised land? These are some crazy things. How am I going to tell the people to follow me? What authority are they? Who are you? And God responded in the way that Jesus is responding as he gives these I am statements in the Gospel of John by saying, I am that I am. Ego emi in the Greek. I am that I am. That means I am all things to all people. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the true vine. I am the good shepherd. I am the door. I am light in the darkness. I am the bread of life. I am living water. I am all of those things. But this week, we focus in very specifically on the core of who Jesus is. This one's for the trailer. In the middle of all of this, part seven, I am the resurrection and the life. It is meant to orient you to the rest of the story of who Jesus Christ is. He is the resurrection and the life. Amen? Or to say it another way, he makes dead things alive. Or to say it yet another way, he injects life into lifeless things. That is who he is. I'm repeating different versions of essentially the same thing because I feel like when we come to church and someone says Jesus is the resurrection and the life, we're like, mm, yes, yes, he is. Amen, brother. It's a very astute observation, right? As if it's not like the most amazing thing you've ever heard of in your life. I just stood here and told you that our God's defining characteristic is that he takes dead things and makes them alive, as if like that just happens at a carnival somewhere, right? Something is dead and all of a sudden life is just made into it. We can't ever yada yada that. The world would love us to yada yada that. Yeah, he makes dead things alive. I get that. Yeah, I get that. That's just like church speak. We can't ever just make that church speak because he is not bored of making dead things alive. So we should never become bored of him making dead things alive. I could be so bold as to say this morning that if you're here in this building, if you're listening online, if you're, if you're within the sound of my voice, God has something here that's dead in you right now that he wants to inject life into this morning. And when he promises and says, I am the resurrection and the life, we have to take that as a promise and we have to get excited about that. And we should come every single time that we worship together, that we open our Bibles, that we meet in the Holy Spirit we should come with that same expected attitude that whatever's dead in my life, God can add life to and make alive again. We stand with me this morning as we read the story surrounding this amazing statement, sort of break down some things that we can take away from it. We're not going to read the entire chapter uh, for, for time's sake. We got some kids waiting for us. Um, but uh, if you stand with me, we will uh, we'll read through here just some a uh, couple of, of scriptures here. If you don't have a Bible, they'll be on the screen, so you can use the Bibles that are below. If you don't have a Bible of your own, I've been saying this for a few weeks, take it home. That's your gift from us. Only deal is you got to read it every day. That's the only deal. So starting in verse 1, it says, Now a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. It was, it was that Mary who anointed the Lord with fragrant oil and wiped his feet with her hair whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore, the sisters went to him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. When Jesus heard that, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that, she, that he was sick, he stayed two more days in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to his disciples, Let's go to Judea again. Drop down to verse 17 for me. It says, so then Jesus came. He found that he had already been in the tomb for four days, he being Lazarus. 
Now, Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles, and many of the Jews had joined the women around Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. Now, Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went to him and met him, and Mary was sitting in the house. Now, Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the son of God who is to come into the world. Drop down with me again to verse 38, last little section here. Then Jesus again, groaning in himself, came. believe you would see the glory of God. Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead man was lying, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me, and I know that you always hear me, but because people who are standing by, I said this, that they may believe that you sent me. Now, when he had said these things, he cried with a loud, loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he who had died came out bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to him, Loose him and let him go. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading and the hearing of his word this morning. You may be seated. Lazarus, come forth. It's a good thing that Jesus specifically said Lazarus himself, because if not, and he just yelled out, come forth to a group of dead people, they all would have came in. That's the power of Jesus Christ right there. But he specifically said, Lazarus, come forth. And he le legitimately spoke out and acted out the words that Jesus Christ said when he said, I am the resurrection and the life. I made a dead thing come back to life. Amazing, amazing, amazing thing. And as we go into the Easter season, this is the, 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 the titular uh, uh, event that kicks off really the Easter season. It's this event, <laughs> making a dead man come back to life, that had everybody in the, in the area freaking out, that had them wanting to arrest and lay hands on Jesus and put him on the cross. All the events of Easter really start right here in this moment. But by way of context, uh, context before we really start digging in here, this particular story has a prequel. So I want to make sure that we know the prequel uh, before we get into the story. Who doesn't want to know the prequel before we get into the story? Only Star Wars thinks you need to know the prequel after the story has already ended. Oh, I just, I just got to look for my wife, Star Wars geek over here. Um, we've got another prequel. Uh, it's a story that's found for us. Uh, we're not going to turn there, but it's found for us in Luke chapter 10. Uh, and it's when we are first introduced to this, these siblings, this family, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. I would encourage you this week to read it in your own time to sort of reorient yourself to the relationships that are at stake here in this story that we're reading about this morning. But the most important thing to know for this morning is that these are legitimate friends of Jesus. Not in the way that like we're all friends of God or we're all God's children. No, these are like legitimate, like friendly Lazarus was Jesus' boy. This, they, they, if, if, there was a, if there was a game on, I don't know what, what game, what sport would have been at the time. I don't know, some Quidditch. I don't know, that. Now I just went to Harry Potter. I'm sorry. Um, whatever was happening, if there was a game on, Jesus would go to Lazarus' house to watch the game, that type of thing. They, they were friends in that way. The scripture even calls them out. Verse 5 says, now Jesus, and it doesn't say love this family. Jesus loved Martha, verse 5, and her sister, and Lazarus. He had love for each and every one of us. And we need to think of Jesus in those same terms, right? Like just, just side note type of thing. I think it's very easy for us to believe that Jesus loved the whole world. For God so loved the whole world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever would believe in him would have, would have everlasting life. And we can believe that and we can understand that. But when we think of it in terms of, yeah, Jesus loves this whole room, but does Jesus love me? And I would say it's verses like five, verse five here, where we can point to and say, Jesus loves you. Jesus loved Mary and Martha and Lazarus. He loves you for who you are, for who he's called you to be. He loves everything about you. So these people 
truly cared for Jesus, and Jesus truly cared for them. They were friends of Jesus. There is a relationship between these people. So, what does this story mean for us? I said earlier, every time we open our Bibles or meet together for worship, we should do it with the expectation for the resurrection and the life to do some resurrecting and some life giving to us in our everyday lives. That should be the goal every single time that we open up our Bibles or we come together to worship. But it's difficult. Oftentimes there's a lot of disappointment that we walk through those doors with. Even, if, even there's disappointment when we open up that Bible in the morning. There's tiredness. There's difficulty trying to get to that point where we have the expectation that there's going to be life injected into what we are doing. It's very difficult for us to get to that point. So this morning I'd like to give you three quick things from these scriptures to help us orient ourselves so that every time we are face-to-face with Jesus, we can be prepared for that resurrecting life. Amen? Amen. This is just some good things to take away. First one, number one, is that his delays are not always denials. His delays are not always denials. Verse 6 says, so when he heard that he was sick, he stayed two more days in the place where he was. Then after that, he said to his disciples, let's go to Judea again. Jesus found out that his, let's just call him his BFF, uh, was sick and was dying. And he was like, okay, I got you. And then he stayed two more days before he decided to move towards fixing that problem. He doesn't go right away. You have to think that for Mary and Martha, this was a difficult pill to swallow, right? Them knowing that Jesus knew that he was sick and Jesus didn't do anything about it for at least two days. And he didn't even start to make his way to do anything about it for at least two two days. You have to imagine that this was a difficult pill to swallow. And you're like, no, Jesus, Mary and Martha, like, you know, they're so spiritual. They're in the Bible. How could they have a problem? I know they had a problem because I relate to this because it's family stuff. And I got a big Italian family and family stuff just speaks to me in scripture sometimes. You want to know what I know? They both say the exact same thing to Jesus. What does that remind me of? That reminds me of being at my grandma's table and everybody's talking about something going on in the family and they all have the same speaking points because we've all talked about it. Can you believe Jesus didn't come? If he wouldn't have come, our brother wouldn't have died. Check out what Mary says. Verse 21, Martha says, now Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Check out Mary in verse 32. Then Mary said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Those are the speaking points of Mary and Martha's family. You guys know what I'm talking about. You families get around a table. We all know what's going on. We all know whose side we're on on this. They have some conversations about this. Jesus just decided to hang out. And if he would have come, we know Lazarus would have been alive, but he's not. So Jesus, we're a little bit disappointed about this. It was a discussion. And there was disappointment based off of the delay. Based off of the delay. It's this feeling of, I'm happy you're here, Jesus. But I was kind of expecting more. But how can I really ask more of Jesus? I'm disappointed in you, God, but how can I come out and say I'm disappointed in God? We get that, right? We can all relate to that. We trust God for something. All right, God, we are going to be faithful in our giving right now. It's been crazy for us. It's been crazy times, but we got paid today. We are going to be faithful in the giving because we know that you've called us to give so that you can use that as a mechanism to bless us with. So we're going to be faithful in it this moment, in this moment. And then a week later comes and it's like, it's a whole nother week before payday? What happened? Where were we at? Where's the delay? Where are those blessings? I was expecting those blessings to happen. Like the moment I, I, I put in my tithe or I, I, I was faithful in the giving, now, guys, I've been there. I've been there. I know how difficult that is. We got a small family, usually one income. I know how difficult those things can be. You're trying to find a new place to live. God, I know you've called me and my family to this area. We've struggled with finding the right place to live. It's got the the perfect schools, and we can connect, and there are people around. But now it's six months later, and we're still on a waiting list because it's Buckeye, and there's 300 people every day that's that's going into Buckeye. Where, Where are you, God? I'm having a really hard time. But, God, I thought that you had... And the answer for us is the same as it was for Mary and Martha, that his delays are not always his denials. 
We don't see eternity in the way that God sees eternity. We see what's right in front of us. God is outside of time. He sees our entire timeline. As he looks at us, he sees our past, he sees our present, and he sees our future. And he knows that there's just around the bend going to be the blessing that he's ready to pour out on you. And he just needs you to wait and to get there. And he knows that that house that you've been waiting for is not the house that you think you're going to get into. It's the one that you didn't even think you were qualified for. But God found it. God found it, and he was ready for it. Heidi and I tried to move out to Buckeye two years before we actually moved out to Buckeye. Now, this was 10 years ago. We thought this was the place for us. We were getting out west. This house needed to go. We were in escrow for like 90 days, and the bank pulled our funding. Nope, not going to happen. And then like a year and a half later, all of a sudden, a, a house that was three times as big, less expensive, the perfect place for us to grow our family was there. It was just around the bend. It was just around the bend, but we couldn't see it there in the moment. It felt like darkness when the bank pulled our funding. When we got that phone call and said, sorry, I know we told you something, but we're going to tell you something else right now. That felt like darkness. That felt like two days of, of delaying. That felt like, where, what are we even doing here, God? But then God had something special for us around the bend. And it's just waiting. It's being able to have the strength to endure through the waiting. And you're like, okay, well, there's the shoe to drop, right? It takes strength to endure through the waiting. But that's the best part about who he is. The book of Isaiah, chapter 41, tells us this. Chapter 41, verse 10. Don't be afraid, for I am with you. Don't be discouraged, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will hold you up with my victorious, I guess I got to talk, right hand. That it's not just waiting all by yourself. It's not just hanging out over on the bench and just taking in all the storms while you're doing all the waiting. It's, I'll be with you right there through it. I will carry you all the way through it. I will hold you up with my victorious right hand, and we will make through this together. His delays are not always his denial. Number two, roll away that stinky stone. Roll away that stinky stone. Verse 38 tells us, then Jesus again, groaning in himself, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone laid against it. And he said, take away the stone. Martha said, said to him, Lord, by this time, there's a stench, for he's been dead four days. Martha is a titan in the Bible. My wife and I relate to Martha. My, my wife and I, we both married a Martha. Like, that's just who, our personality. You know, they sometimes say, like, oh, Mary and a Martha, they kind of get together. Somebody who sits at Jesus' feet and just loves and somebody who's always working. Not in this house. Like, we just, we keep working and we just butt up against each other, essentially. Um, so my wife and I, we love Martha. We hold Martha in very high esteem in our house. We can learn a lot in terms of serving God and coming closer to a relationship with God based off of Martha's willingness to just get down and do the dirty work, right? But we can learn something from Martha here. And every Martha personality, like me, like my wife, who's out there, we can learn this because we all feel this. Every Martha feels what Martha's doing. Jesus, it stinks over there. Like, it's a little uncouth to be rolling away a stone. Like, it's, it's going to smell really, really bad. Not like it's her smell, but like it's her family's smell. So, like, you know, it's just that weird smell. Nobody wants their house to smell when people come over, right? Like, you don't want to ever have that smell in your house, right? All of us Marthas can relate to what she's doing here. But we can't let Jesus getting to what's on the other side of the stone and our anxiety about what's on the other side of the stone stop him from doing a miraculous movement, from injecting life into him, into our lives, right? Obviously, hindsight being what it is, she, she wouldn't be trying to hold up this, this event, this, this in, enormous event in, in the life of Jesus Christ. But, um, you know, she's trying to make a good impression on people. I hate it when my garage is dirty. <laughs> my garage is dirty right now. We've got a lot of stuff moving around. And i got people coming in and out and stuff's happening. I want to make sure that my garage looks Nice, but we got to get past the appearances. We got to get past, we got to let God cut through to who we actually are. Because you know the key is, he knows what's on the other side of the rock. 
He already knows what's on the other side of the rock. But we play this game oftentimes with God like we think we can hold back that ugly side of us, that stinky side of us. Like he doesn't want to know about the thoughts that I have in the dark or the horrible things that I have done in my life. Like he doesn't already know what's on the other side of that stone. So it's not that he doesn't know the information already. It's that he needs you, you, to roll the stone away. Nothing's going to happen in terms of him injecting his life into your life, making that dead thing come alive. Nothing's going to happen until you roll away the stone. He's not going to do it for you. You have to choose and say, I'm going to let you see the deepest, darkest, ugliest, stinkiest parts of me, God, because we're going to get to work here. Nothing happens in a therapy session if you're just going to put a wall up, right? If you're not going to actually explain to the person who you're trying to get some help with your mental health, if you're just holding things back all the time, nothing's going to happen. Many times, counselors, therapists, they'll just see right through that. Hey, I think we're done here because you're not letting me in, right? And we try to do the same thing when it comes to Jesus Christ as if he doesn't already know what's on the other side of the rock. Psalm 44, 21 says, God would surely have known it for he knows the secrets of every heart. We can't hide anything from God. He knows who we are, but we still have to roll that stone away to give him the opportunity to inject life into our lives. Last one. Loose those grave clothes. Loose those grave clothes. Verse 44 said, he who had died, Lazarus, came out bound hand and foot with grave clothes and his face wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to him, loose him and let him go. Sometimes Jesus does the thing, (laughs) the Jesus thing. He releases you from something. He gives you life. He gives you victory over something that you've been struggling with. But we like to keep the grave clothes on. The book of Colossians talks about this idea of a new man versus the old man. The new man being when God saves you, when he puts your faith in Jesus Christ, he makes you a new man. All the old has passed away. But we like to kind of put the old man back on like a pair of like well-worn pajamas because that's, that's who we like to be. That's who we're comfortable being. And those are grave clothes. Those pajamas, those old man, holy, nasty pajamas are grave clothes. That's who I always am. Those sinful habits are so easy to get back into. But Jesus tells us, and Noah, you can come up here with this. Jesus tells us, take those grave clothes off. And grave clothes can be many different things. They can be relationships with people that we, have, that we know are no good for us. That we know that God has called us to something higher, but when we get back around that group of people, it's just way too easy for us to fall back into that old man, to put on those nasty pajamas again and feel comfortable back in that person who God, we know that God has called us away from. It can be certain activities that they leave us susceptible to falling back into something. I'm thinking of like, I don't know, trips to casinos or with our friends. Now, again, those aren't bad things. Hanging out with friends, recharging. You got some teachers coming off of spring break. That's a good thing. That's a good thing. But if you get around those types of people or put yourself into those types of people and, it, and they are now used as like mechanisms to get you to go back and put those grave clothes back on to be the person God's already called you out of that. You have no, no, no reason to be there anymore. You've already gotten past that. You were on your knees. There was hard work that had to go into it. God has released you from it. Don't go put those grave clothes back on. Take those grave clothes off. Maybe it's doubt. I'm holding on to doubt in my heart. I can't put my faith in Jesus Christ. Sounds good. He makes some good, decent points up there, but I can't really put my full faith into Jesus because I have doubts about who he is. Doubt can be a grave clothed. Just a little something that if you take that off, just say, I'm going for it. I hear you this morning. When you say you're the resurrection and life, I see dead things in my life and I want them made alive. And I'm going to throw that doubt off and I'm going to give you my opportunity. I'm gonna, you're standing at my heart and you're knocking. I'm going to say yes this time. I'm going to get rid of those grave clothes because there's life 
and life more abundantly. When he says he's the resurrection and the life, there's a Greek word in the life. There's a couple different words. The one, there's one that's just bios. That just means living. That just means being alive, blinking eyes, beating heart. That's not the word they use here. The word they use here when he says his life is life and life more abundantly. It's everything about life that God has called you, these places on your heart. He loves you, and he wants you to just throw off those grave clothes and say, all right, I will answer you this time. I'll throw the doubt off. I'll throw all the rest of it off, and I will put my faith in you. That's what he asks of us this morning. Will you bow your heads with me? Father God, we come into these rooms to worship you, Father, to get close to you, to hear from you in your word. So that, because there's so much noise that's happening out in the world all the time that's trying to get our attention away from being the men and women that you have called us to be, Father. And Lord, when we read the trailer, the core of who you are, you make dead things alive. Father, I ask that you help us to just marinate on that. That some of us are in this room and we have not put our faith in you. We are walking around, eyes open, mouths open, we're living life, but really what it is is it's a tomb. And Father, we just need to have you put our faith in you to really feel that life and that life more abundantly. And so what we're gonna do here as we close this out with every head bowed, if this morning that feels like you, you have yet to put your faith in Jesus Christ, and you're ready to throw off the grave clothes of doubt and all of the anxiety that comes with it, and you're ready to say, you know what? Maybe this salvation thing is for me, because let me tell you, it is for you. There is nothing more for you than a relationship with Jesus Christ. And if that's you this morning, just raise up your hand. I just want to see your hand as a statement of faith, and I want to pray for you. I see your hand. That's with you. We're going to pray a prayer in church. Those believers, those seasoned believers, I just invite you to pray with me as encouragement for those making decision in this moment. But it's a real simple prayer. It says, dear Jesus, I want to put my faith in you. I want you to resurrect my life. I want you to come into my life and be the Lord of my life. I believe that you died on a cross and that you rose three days later to save me. Come into my life. Be my Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer this morning, there are angels rejoicing in heaven, waiting to welcome you whenever you leave this place, this tent stakes that we have here on earth. When we go home to heaven, they're going to be rejoicing this morning with you this morning. We stand. We're going to sing one more chorus here. I invite you. I just said my words here from the pulpit. I invite you that as we sing this chorus that you spend some time with God and they make them your words. Pray to God. Whatever decision you need, let's take some time here. Be with him and then I'll come up and close us as we leave.